Ok. Good morning. Good to see you all out this morning. It's a wonderful day, even though it's raining. Somebody reminded me, says, you know how much snow we had this year? I said, oh, we didn't have much snow at all. And they said, uh-huh. And if we don't get rain now, we're going to have an awful dry summer. So, you know, we need to know that, uh, you know, God sends the rain to bring up the flowers and the, the lawns and all the other things. And uh, it's starting to really green up and be beautiful. So rejoice in all of that. And especially rejoice that we have... Uh, a place to come and a roof over our heads. Amen. And we're here to praise the Lord. So uh, as Edna plays uh, something to bring us into this time of worship, uh, turn your phones off and turn your attention on to see what God has for you today. Amen. 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 Anyway, so if you'd like to give to a person, person, 
we take it all down at the very end of each month, which starts today, isn't it? Tomorrow? Yeah, I can't believe it. Tomorrow's May 1st. Wow. Um, we're going to be looking forward to doing our outreach on Memorial Day. And so if you can be here for that and be a part of that, for setting up and you know, giving out some pamphlets and Bibles and talking to people about the Lord. And, you know, we, we give out stuff to our drinking meat too. So um, it's a blessing. So if you can be a part of that, let Anderson know. He's not here quite yet, but um, he is in charge of outreach. Okay? So praise the Lord. Prayer meeting is 5 o'clock on Mondays, and we do a Excuse me, what time? 5 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Prayer meeting? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was thinking five or seven. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, Back praise the Lord. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we must be married. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, we try to finish each other's sentences, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, so prayer meetings at five o'clock, yes. and we do it by by a conference call. If you want to be a part of that, just um, text Pastor 203-984-0367 and let us know if you want to be a part of it. You don't have to do it every week. You can just do it when you can. Um, it's a real blessing. We um, see wonderful, wonderful uh, answers to prayer. We see burdens lifted. Um, we shed tears sometimes as well as laughter. So praise God. But there's plenty to pray about in this world, in our families, in our lives. So, uh, you know, we were, I, was, I was just talking to Everett about that, you know. <clears throat> he said, it's good to be good friends with God. And he is so right, you know, in saying that. And that, you know, have you ever washed your keys and a half an hour later you find you say, oh yeah, I should really probably pray about this and ask the Lord. <laughs> when like a half an hour ago, you should have prayed. <laughs> it's not too late to pray, definitely. But, you know, sometimes you can save yourself a whole lot of aggravation if you go to the Lord first and you go to him soon and quickly and all that. So I'm guilty as charged. I don't always do it right away. But um, it works. So we thank God for that. He's listening. He's listening to every little thing. Doesn't matter how big, how small um, your burden is. He, he will do it. He can do it. Uh, Bible study, Tuesday evenings downstairs. Micah Cardamone is leading it and doing a wonderful job. And um, the guys that come have lots of questions. So pastor's there not to really direct it all, but to answer questions as needed. And um, they have a really good time. I know Pat's been going too. She's been having a wonderful time going. So praise the Lord. Uh, worship service next week again at 10 o'clock. Bring a friend. Come back and, and um, you know, bring someone that hasn't been here for a while. You know, communion. Try to, you know, urge them on. And uh, we have communion next week too. Praise the Lord. Okay, I think that's it for now. Praise the Lord. It's a good day to sing his praise. So open up your hymn books, if you would, to 436. 436.
may be seated. Praise God. You have a testimony? Anybody have a testimony? Yes. Trish? Amen. Good to be back. Good to see you. Amen. 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 Anybody else have a testimony? Yes. Amen. Uh, you know, the Lord has put just the right people in his path. He's doing physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. So a lot of therapy. And the man that, you know, he met his physical therapist and nutrition in last week. And uh, he's been doing it forever and ever. And that's all he does. These people are so patient. So he really knows what he's doing. And it's so encouraging. And we were very encouraged, Greg, and seeing. Pastor Bob, when he was up at Noel Hospital, and he said in the time between Noel Hospital and Danbury rehab, he already looked so much better. Um, so, yeah, they know what they're doing, and he's going to be hopefully transferred in a couple of weeks down to Pennsylvania, where he's actually retiring and moving. Amen. <laughs> that kind of put a little hiccup in his plan, but God knows. Amen. He's working it all out. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Trish. I forgot to mention that this coming Wednesday, Thursday is my birthday. Okay. Oh, All nice. right. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Chris. Uh, okay, on my nephew Jeremiah. He is now up to three pounds. All right. Two more pounds and he gets to go home. Hallelujah. Keep eating. Hallelujah. <laughs> Two more pounds. Hallelujah. That's good. Yes. Jim. Yes, Bob. Yeah, I went through a rough patch last night. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the week before, I should say, I made it through last week. Um, anyway, uh, I was brought to my knees in two ways, <laughs> in pain and in prayer. Amen. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on, and I asked God for, for help. Amen. 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 You know, just telling you that uh, I'm glad Norwalk Hospital got everything right and that you're re recovering and everything else, but trying to find out where you were when you were in the hospital. <laughs> you know, I... They couldn't really tell me and this and that, and then all of a sudden I get that that text to you at 10 o'clock at night saying, I'm going home. <laughs> like, really? Praise God. Well, that's good. Don't want to be with all those sick people up there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> there you go. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Amen. They grow so fast, right? Amen. Turn it into little people. Amen. 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 Thank God. Amen. Everett, we I know you had a tough week, so prayer requests are for you. Mike. He's, been, he's had a lot of trouble for a while. Okay. And I lost my brother Steve, he passed away with a heart 
contact with you early in the week. And then uh, after that, the next day, my niece Mary Jane, that we've been praying for, she passed away on that day. Amen. And yeah. the only other thing is I need prayer for myself because I have to get a shot in my eye here on Tuesday. Okay. God has been really good with that, so we'll just keep praying on that one. Amen. Amen, amen. Any prayer requests? Yes? Prayers for my daughter-in-law, Mary, who uh, had her surgery quite a while ago. Something happened that is not healing correctly. So. And prayers for Jeannie and my regular ones, um, Janet, Tammy, Tina, and me. Amen. Yeah, we were uh, informed that Jeannie Gordon uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer. But uh, when I finally got a chance to talk to her on the phone, she says, well, it's good and it's bad. It's good because they said that it's all encapsulated and they can actually make it smaller and then it just remove the whole thing and I won't even have to have chemo and everything will be fine. I'm at, uh, you know, you have a, a, a stage of cancer, you know, stage four is like the worst that goes all the way down. Well, she's at stage zero, they said. So she's at zero, so that, that sounds really good. So, but just keep her in prayer as she prepares for the surgery. They said that they have to wait a little bit. So whatever they have to do, and then uh, we'll just pray that it all comes out well. Praise God. Amen? Amen. 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 Anybody else have prayer? Yes, Chris? Yes, my right knee. I have a bond that I have arthritis in it and a possible torn meniscus. I forgot. What's your nephew's name? Jeremiah. What? Jeremiah. Oh, that's a good name. <laughs> Amen. Yes. My great niece, um, she's like eight. Her uncle is the one that was just found killed in Bridgeport, and she's had a really hard time. Oh. She needs to wear again that side of the family. Yes. Um, praying for her family. Family. And then we uh, started going back to church. Back to church. And um, praying for my girlfriend, Chelsea, that she was having a gap that was her doctor on May 6th. Okay. Uh, and mental health and a good counselor for everyone. Amen. Butch? Yeah. Uh, well, first, um, continue prayers for my brother in law. He's doing a little slightly better with the bleeding, but we still don't have any answers. We're still learning to do this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, we're just kind of waiting there to see if we come up with it. But uh, there was a little bit of improvement, so we're thankful for that. Um, my sister, my sister, she gets the same shots I get with her in her eye. She just had it on Friday. Usually it bothers her for the next few days, but this time it was uh, a lot better. We took the doctor in the shot, and she was really pleased about that. Amen. And, uh, that's kind of a little testimony as far as I'm going to go. Yes. It's, it's still improving. So, my younger sister, the other one, she just went through going through all this stuff with her with her problem, and uh, we had to have some more blood work done. And she saw the doctor. And they I get to be here before he says, uh, 
All right. Amen. Yes. Sorry. Oh, I got you. Really? Wow. Okay. Yes. Amen. Be a little closer, huh? Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's a good thing. A good thing, good thing. Good, good. Amen. Okay. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are so good to us, Lord God. There are so many things that we could think about, Lord God. We thank you for people who have had surgeries and people who are going to have surgeries. And Lord God, know that you are the great physician. We pray for continued healing touch in their lives and in their bodies, in their minds. Lord God, that that healing would continue. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones. We pray that ever it would be strengthened, that you would continue to touch his heart, Lord God. And he is missing his uh, brother and his niece, Lord God, as they have passed away. And we pray, Lord God, that you would grant him your peace. Lord God, we thank you for uh, all these requests, Lord God, for friends and everything else. We pray that you be with these uh, friends and neighbors and family members, Lord God, and for Jeremiah, Lord God, as he continues to grow, Lord God, continue to, to touch him and continue to touch his parents, Lord God, continue to touch this great niece, Lord God, who is suffering the loss of her, of her father, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would continue to uh, touch all these that we've talked about that, that have had, had those shots in the eye, Lord God, and that you pray that you continue to help them to not have any ill effects, Lord God. As, as Everett has had month after month after we pray that things have gone so, so well. So we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. We pray for journeying mercies, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would just be with uh, this granddaughter who's traveling back, Lord God, and keep her safe and all the other students with her, Lord God, as she has had a wonderful time. We pray for her safe return. We pray, Lord God, for uh, a new job, for those who are, are looking for new jobs, Lord God, and for provision for their family, for those who are looking for a new place to live. For Lord God, we pray that you just work it all out. We pray for continued health and strength with Bob uh, recovering from his stroke, Lord God, Pastor Bob, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you would just give him peace of mind, Lord God, as he goes through this process, Lord God, and that you would give him uh, rest and just be able to return to complete strength. We thank you, Lord, and trust you, Lord God. We pray for those, the family of Stu Sr. who has uh, passed away, Lord God. We pray for comfort to them, Lord God, as they have that. We pray for Mike Horvath, which has been on our hearts for months and months, and he has to have that surgery, and he has to deal with that cancer. And we pray, Lord God, that you would help him, Lord God, to call upon you, and that you would touch and heal and strengthen him, Lord God. For Chris's sister, Lord God, 
Help her to stop smoking so she can have the surgery, Lord God. It's a win-win situation, Lord God. But help her, Lord God, help her, Lord, to overcome. Give her the strength that she needs, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, and praise you. We pray for the continuance of this service this day, Lord God, that you would continue to speak to our hearts, Lord God, that we would be open to receive what you have for each one of us, Lord, a special message, a special word, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would continue to touch us all. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we had some special music last night, and uh, they were so good that I invited them to do special music. I said, hey, let's plan on the third Sunday of the month that you would come in and do some special music. That way, we could also remind you that they're going to be there on the fourth Saturday, so third Sunday. They'll be here, there the next Saturday to... Uh, Come on out and, and enjoy the praise and worship time. So we're, uh, we're trying to put some things together like, like that. Uh, we have been blessed from time to time with our special music. And, uh, you know, we are just uh, enjoying what we can receive. But this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Timothy. Open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy. It's quite a ways back there, so I'll give you a little time to find it. You know, you can go through all the uh, letters of the, the epistles that uh, were written until you get to 1 Timothy, then 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, starting with chapter 3. So everybody can find 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Giving you some time to find it. I'm going to pray just a little bit. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray for your anointing on this message. I pray, Lord God, that we would be able to receive your word and apply it to our hearts, Lord God. Touch me as I bring forth the word and touch the hearers of this word too, Lord God, with an anointing to receive exactly what you would have them to receive. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we go through this chapter and look at what is going on, when it's written to Timothy, it's coming from Paul. And at this particular time in the, uh, his ministry, He's now uh, locked up in Rome. He's being prepared to be executed. And every day he's in this tiny little cell. He's been moved out of a, a different situation. He's been in a lot of different jails, but this one is right there. And from what I understand, you can actually see where the execution takes place. And it's kind of like a pit they throw him into and, and they can see out through this slit where people are being executed. And you never know when it's your day. So Timothy knows that uh, his teacher, his example, um, has gotten into a situation where he will probably not be coming home, not have opportunity uh, to hear from him, not be able to be taught by him. So he's receiving these letters from Rome. The instruction is given to him to encourage him and to have him to move on and to go into more ministry. As we, the church, look at this letter, we need to hold on to it that we are being prepared to get through difficult times and to be prepared for ministry, just like Timothy is being prepared. So that's the context where we're seeing this message be coming from and it says this but realize this in the last days 
difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding on to a form of godliness, and though they deny the power thereof, avoid such people as these. Now I'm going to stop right there. That's just the, the first five verses. And you take a look at that and you go, whoa! That's, you know, Pastor, that's a, a, a lot of not good stuff. You know? Well, it gets better as we go on. So I, I want you to focus on this. It is a warning and the idea that it says, and most Bible theologians and everybody who looks at it and looking at the other places in the Bible where it says the last days, what does the last days mean? It means the days between when Jesus was ascended into heaven and until he comes back again. So what he left and when he's coming back. That is the last days. Now, some people say, well, you know, they keep saying he's coming back. He's, he's coming back. He's coming back. Well, he, he is. When? We don't know. Jesus says no one really knows but the Father himself. Amen. You know, so we need to, and here's the thing, be ready. There are some things that will help us to know when that time is going to be. There are some indicators, and we see all kinds of indicators uh, in different parts of the Bible that speak to us about that. But in this particular portion, he's saying it's not going to be easy. It says difficult times. Well, difficult times, you know, means that, you know, oh, I forgot something at the store and I, I have to go back, you know. It's difficult to, to redo something, but it's not talking about just little difficulties. It's talking about big difficulties. In fact, the uh, King James, I like the way it puts it, it says perilous times. It says that in the last days, perilous times will come. Another time in the Bible where they use the same Greek word is when Jesus was uh, seeing the demon act the man who was possessed coming out of the tombs, that no one could even be in that area. He came out and was so furious. He was so uh, powerful in, in that, that when Jesus came to him, everything changed. But before that, no man could even go by there. So here it is saying, these horrible times, these difficult or perilous times, are going to come, okay? Before Jesus comes back again, there's going to be some pretty hard times. It goes on to describe, for people will be. These are the things that people are going to be. And it goes on and it speaks. And I have a, a little bit of a, a list that Dr. Uh, John Piper said to know what we're talking about here. So what it says that for people will be lovers of themselves means they're narcissistic, narcissistic, right? I can't really put up my tongue. Narcissists, okay? They love themselves more than anything else. Lovers of money, materialistic. You know, that's all that they're really worried about, you know? And, you know, we need to know that it's, it's not money, it's the love of money. It is the misuse of money. Lovers of money. Then it goes on and it says, proud. Those are drawing attention to their own accomplishments. I, I've heard even people within the church that have some problems with some of these things. You know, 
that, oh, well, you know, I was with so-and-so name proppers, right? And uh, people who have attention, well, look at me, I, I'm, you know, this and this and this. Be careful. You know, we need to know that there's people even in uh, the world today that are, quote, Christians, that have some problems with these things. For people will be doing these things and being drawn away from God. You see, Satan has been a liar from the very beginning. And he has made people be kind of selfish. Adam and Eve are in the garden and they got the whole garden. God gave it to them and everything's good. Like, oh, wow. And then Satan comes in and twists the truth. It says to Eve, he says, hey, you know, why don't you go eat of that tree? Didn't God say, and this is, it is the word of God, says, didn't God say that you could eat of all the different trees? And she says, yes. Eve says, yes. God did say that we could eat of all of the trees. But God said, if we eat of that tree, we shall surely die. And then what does Satan do? He twists the truth and says, well, he just, he wants to keep something from you. He knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like God. Whoa. The world today has a, a real problem with that. Maybe if I have enough money, maybe if I have enough things, maybe if I'm proud enough about myself, maybe if I'm arrogant enough, maybe th then I'll be just like God. I am so wonderful. Wrong. Wrong. See, Satan twisted the truth and deceived Eve. And we see these different things. It's not about the things that you have. You know, it's about being able to really love what God has given you. The situation we're in. It says that they're arrogant. Okay, they're so involved in their selfishness. Abusive. You know, meaning that they want to do harm verbally or physically to people. It seems like today every time you look in the news, something else has happened. The road rage has just gotten to be crazy. And all these different things that are going on. The hurtful things that people say. You see, my mama always said, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. You know, I think that we need to really hold back on some things. You really have to say something harmful and, and this? Do you really have to abuse people? It goes on, it says, disobedient to parents. Well, you know, it goes far beyond disobedient to parents. It means that you have a rebellious spirit. You know, I, I grew up in the 60s and, and 70s, and, you know, there was a lot of rebellion going on. You know, the war in Vietnam and the, the whole situation with that and the, the whole hippie thing that, you know, we grew up in and rebelling against the man, the different things that were going on. And all of these things were bringing just this rebellious spirit, and it's not good. Another thing he goes on, it says, ungrateful. You know, ungrateful. You know, you don't even appreciate what you have. You, you think that you're owed uh, something else. You can't be grateful for it. Oh, I deserve it. I deserve everything. Well, that's not what God says. It says unholy. It says here that we look at these things that we devaluate Jesus and what he's done. We don't look to him, we look to these other things. Unholy, unloving, you're heartless, unable to be sympathetic and empathetic, unable to, to see it from the other guy's position. And the world has certainly gotten to be more of that. It goes on to be irreconcilable, unable to forgive. What did Jesus say? Jesus was asked by Peter, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times? That's kind of generous. <laughs> Jesus says 70 times seven. Don't give up forgiving your brother. Jesus continued to say that he was willing to forgive us if we would ask. In fact, it says in 1 John that we would be forgiven if we were to ask, repent. 
He is faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. But we, in turn, need to have a, the, an attitude of forgiveness. You know, before Jesus left, he gave us probably one more commandment. He, he says, one more commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. Boy, talk about dropping a bomb. I'm supposed to love like you love? You're talking about going all the way to the cross? You're so talking about sacrificial death for someone else? It says, no greater love has this than a man give up his life for his friend. And you are my friends. Are we really willing and able to look at the problems that we see in the world today and know that we will be attacked by our, for our Christian faith and for the stands that we make and for the things that we say that are according to what the Word of God says? There are many that even try to church, change the church, try to change what it really says. It says here that we should be able to reconcile if we want to be reconciled, we need to forgive. It says in the fact that when we taught the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts, our transgressions, as we forgive those who sin against us. Are we ready to forgive those who sin against us? It goes on that people will be slanderous. They will distort the truth. They'll be malicious gossips, devilish distortions. So that they can make ourselves look better and call good evil. Without self-control, meaning that you have ambitions and things and you can't control yourself. So I was told of a, a little boy who was at home and his mom had just made some beautiful chocolate cupcakes. And she put nice white vanilla frosting on the top. And there were a dozen cupcakes. And she put them out on the plate and she set them on the table. And the little boy came over and his eyes, Mom, can I have one of those cupcakes? Not till you eat your dinner. It's not even dinner time yet. Therefore dessert. Mama, can I, can I have one of those cupcakes? I really, 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 really want one. No, you have to wait. So mom and dad got called out to go down to the store. They had to do something. And the cupcakes were calling. And the little boy looked and he saw this big plate of cupcakes. And he said in his mind, well, they'll never notice if there's one cupcake missing. So I'll just have one. And he ate the cupcake, but he left the crumbs. And he had a little bit of the icing on his, on his face. And when mom and dad came home, they noticed the crumbs. They noticed the icing. And they called him over. He said, why did you eat one of the cupcakes when we told you not to? I didn't eat any of the cupcakes. There was 12, now there's 11. I don't know. You see those crumbs? Yeah. I don't know. It says, do you see the frosting on your mouth? Uh, I don't know. It wasn't me. Unable to tell the truth. Unable to see that we have to control our appetites sometimes. It says that people will be brutal. People will be not loving, unable to see the mercy and grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They will hate things that are good. I can't understand sometimes in the, the way I look at things as I've grown up and I've, I've seen the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and now we're into the 2000s, soon to be into the late 2000s. I can't believe the way things have gotten to all these things. But really, if we look back in the history of, of the world, there have been times when there has been a lot of craziness, a lot of bitterness, a lot of all of these things that are listed that are not good. 
going on. It says people will be treacher treacherous. I mean, breaking promises. Does that sound familiar? Trying to take advantage for themselves. Reckless. Craving ambition. And taking, cake, uh, taking risks. Okay? They will be uh, have uh, blind ambitions. The last one that I'm going to see here is they will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure means the physical things become more important than to admire the divine, to see what God has done. To ever be in the presence of God. If you've ever had that really quiet time when you've understood that God is present. I don't know about you, but sometimes it can just be in a song. I don't have to get up and jump up and wave my hand. I can just be the presence of God. It's so much better than all of these physical things. Things that... Uh, have to do with just like the cupcakes they tantalize us they look at it and they they look so good and well maybe just one we need to know that god wants us to be lovers of god not lovers of things it says in the last part that they would have a form of godliness holding on to it but deny the power thereof and if you look in your Bibles, it says godliness with a small g. In other words, it's a form of religion that people use to gain some kind of treasure, that gain some kind of uh, something that will be for themselves, a personal gain. They would look a certain way in the community. Having an appearance or holding on to this form, but denying the power of God. It says, of all these things, avoid such people as these. Now, I would have to say that we need to know that we should avoid people who are doing these things. We need to be aware of the fact that we can be sucked in, we can be deceived, that we can be uh, affected, and that we can be very susceptible to money to all these other things to be able to not be as loving and forgiving and doing all these other things we need to be very very careful it says avoid such people as this well in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 it says do not be deceived bad company correct uh, corrupts good morals let me say that again. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You want to be corrupted? Hang around with a lot of other people. You know? We need to know that this is what God is saying. Avoid such people as these. And hopefully, when we're around people of like precious faith, when we are in the presence of what God wants us to do, we know that he is able. In the next couple of verses, and I'm not going to uh, expound on this too much, but it talks about uh, among them there are those who, who sneak in or slip into uh, households and hold captive weak women weighed down with sins and various impulses. Now here's the thing that I want. It's not just women. It's all of us. Having learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, some people can read and make an excuse for what they're doing, and they can even take the Word of God and corrupt it. They can change it and say, oh, well, you know, it really doesn't mean that. You know, when Jesus said something, well, he, he kind of got it wrong. Really? Jesus got nothing wrong. Let's put it that way. He is the only perfect one. He wrote the Word. He is the Word. He is all of these things. 
And we need to know that when he says these things, he is calling on us to be more than what this world is calling to make things easy. He's telling that we have to overcome. He says, in this world you will have tribulation. Thank you, Lord. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You see, there's where the, the, the power lies. He says, there will be problems. There will be persecution. There will be problems, but I have overcome it. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. If God be for us, who can stand against us? You know, we need to know that we have somebody that we can be on their side and they are on our side. You get that? We can be on their side and he is on our side to bring the victory. You know, it is an amazing thing that we need to see that God wants us to focus on all these good things. In fact, in Philippians, he says, whatever is good, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is uh, commendable, if there is any experience, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Hello, that's where our time should be spent, thinking on the goodness of God. And then he can help us to overcome some of these other situations. He will be there for you. He will be there. Now, remember I told you that uh, Paul was writing this to Timothy to kind of teach him, to encourage him. So now we've seen all of these, these things, the, the worthlessness and the, the depravity of things. In verse 10, look at it when it says in verse 10 with me. It says, now you, talking to Timothy, follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and persistence. Now, now think about that. He, Paul, is speaking to Timothy, but the Word of God today is speaking to us that we're looking and following these teachings. Not the teachings of man, not the teachings of Paul, but Paul was following the teachings of Christ. Paul was an example of Christ. Paul was able to show, I'm following Jesus, no matter what, you do the same thing. I'm taking these, these steps, you take these steps. Follow my teachings, my conduct, my purpose. Do you have a purpose in your life? A lot of people don't have a purpose in their life at all. But our purpose in life should be to please God, to believe in God. For it's impossible to please God without faith in Him. Here it's saying again, Paul is saying, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance. It says persecutions and suffering have happened. And he goes on to speak of three different places. And in fact, Lystra, <laughs> he was stoned and so much throw, threw rocks at him so much that the rocks actually piled up on him and they thought that he was dead. And his followers, those people that were wanting to see, oh, they're weeping and going on. And they went and they pulled the stones away. And guess what? He wasn't dead. God brought him through. All of these things, he brought him, says in verse 12, indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Hello? Hate to tell you, you will be persecuted if you want to follow Jesus. And the persecution is going to get even worse. I have a friend of mine who's been a, a uh, missionary to China for many, many years. He, he's not over there now and he still wants to go back. And the way that he said it to me, he says, I want to go back at least one more time. You know, he has a heart for the people. 
And he was sharing with me that sometimes the, the people over in China are praying for us in the United States. And of course he says, well, why are you praying for the people in the United States and instead of praying for the, you know, well, we're praying for the people in China, but we're praying for the people in the United States because they don't have persecution that they might respond and know how much God loves them. Wow. That we're not persecuted quite enough so that we can make that decision. You know, we kind of sit on a fence. There's a lot of people in the United States who are sitting on a fence. Well, it's not that bad. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want, really? My, my biggest th question is, do you want to offend God? You know, it's not about judging others. It's about letting God have his way in your life. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And here it's saying, and as I already said in my message, Jesus said, you know, in this world you will have persecution. You will have troubles. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Woo! If he's overcome the world, he's saying, through me, you too can be overcomers. Even when there's a lot of things around, you know, you can be an overcomer. But it says in the next verse, but evil people, okay, and uh, imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Some people are being deceived and they want to deceive others so that they feel better about themselves. He says, you, however, continue to do the things that you have learned and become convinced of knowing these things all the way from your youth. When we see this talk about the youth, you see, he was raised, Timothy, in a Jewish home. He was taught the Old Testament and the wisdom that leads to salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look and hold on to this. Verse 16 says, all scripture, how much of the scripture? All of the scripture is to inspired by God. It's inspired by God. It's brought forth by God. And it's beneficial for the teaching. Okay, we can handle that one. Okay. But look what it says. For the rebuke, Oh, I'm not so happy about being rebuked, about somebody telling me that I did something wrong. For correction, correction means change direction. I've told you so many times. I do it my way. I get on that GPS and it says turn right. <laughs> and I say, nah, I think I'll keep going straight. Not right. We need to be corrected or we're gonna go completely in the wrong direction. We need to be corrected. I was corrected one time when I was learning how to uh, steer a boat. My uncle told me to keep this heading, and there was the compass. He says, so look at the compass, look up. Look at the compass, look up. Keep it on that heading. Keep it on that heading. And I'm going like this. And finally, he came over to me and says, uh, you're not on that heading. I said, well, I'm close. I'm only off by a couple degrees. You know, I'm not off by much. He says, well, how long have been off by a couple degrees? I said, oh, I don't know. He says, well, let me put it to you this way. Forget about the compass right now. When I had you starting to steer, you were supposed to be headed towards that island over there. Now we're headed towards that open area over here. How much difference is there? Ooh, quite a bit of difference. And if you keep on this heading, the distance what becomes greater and greater. The farther we get away from what the heading God has, before we take and we look and make, make a mistake, it says here that we can be corrected that the word of God, all scripture is so that we can be corrected for training in righteousness so that the man or woman 
of God might be fully capable, equipped for every good work. It doesn't say for every pastor, preacher, or missionary. It says for every man or woman of God, if you belong to God, if you are serving God, if you've given your heart to the Lord, it says that the scriptures are there to correct us, train us, sometimes rebuke us, and make us capably equipped for every good work. God wants you to do good works. I'm going to challenge you to start people telling people that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Did anybody tell you today? Jesus loves you. Just uh, was this Monday we went up to see Bob. Okay, we went up to the hospital. And so we said our goodbyes. We're going to go to babysit. And we're walking down the thing. And there was a whole group of nurses at, a nurse, at the nurse's station. And maybe I insulted them, but I said, ladies, because they were all women. I, you know, they said, I said, ladies, has anybody told you today that Jesus loves you? And they kind of said, well, yeah, we know. Some of them were saying, yeah. I said, well, let me be the first. All of you, Jesus loves you. And you wouldn't believe the amount of smiles that all of a sudden, whew, they were like, whoa, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying that sometimes a simple thing that it says, are we prepared for doing some good works? Do we need to know what the word of God is? Do we need to study all scripture? It says study to show yourselves approved. That's what it says. We need to study the word of God. We need to know it. We need to have it. We need to hold on to it. Goes right on in chapter 4. And he says to Timothy, I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now I want you to see, it doesn't say be a, a, a preacher, meaning the way the world looks at it, but the word preacher means a proclaimer. Do you proclaim? Do you tell people? Are you ready in any situation? to be able to tell people about the goodness of God? Are you ready to be able to, in love, this is the tough part, in love to correct somebody, to exhort somebody, to rebuke? A lot of people like to rebuke, pointing a finger. You know, you know how many fingers are pointing back at you when you point a finger at somebody? It's three to one. You need to know that we have to do things in love. We need to be ready. And that the word of God has given this ability for us to be ready in season because the scriptures have prepared us. This is it. The time is coming. Look what it says in verse 3 of chapter 4. The time is coming when they, meaning the people in the world who are living those lives will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will want their ears tickled. Okay? I hope that I'm not tickling your ears. But I hope that you're hearing it from God and not me. Because it's not me. And that they will be turning their lives over and not having truth but aside to myths. You see, there is the thing. Are we fighting the fight? Are we doing what he calls us to do? He says, be able to do the work of an evangelist. An evangelist is telling people who don't know. Pastor, you're confusing me. He says, we're supposed to avoid those people. And now you're telling me to go out and tell those people. 
kind of a, a line, a balancing thing. He says, we're not going to be in that company. We are to tell them and show them our love for Jesus Christ and our love for them to tell them the truth. We need to know that this is where we are going. We need to do the work of an evangelist. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a certified evangelist. And, but are you going out and telling the world about Jesus? Are you taking a stand for Jesus Christ? Are you letting these things that are an epidemic in the world, okay, of being selfish and not knowing God, being godless, by thinking about the things of the earth instead of the things of heaven, we should be like Paul. And as I've told you before, I think Paul, in many ways, was kind of crazy. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, the guy was, you know, oh, he I told you he was in many, many different jails. Oh, to be arrested for Christ's sake, hallelujah. You know, not Rome or this or that or, or any other, but to be arrested for Christ's sake. You better shut up or we're going to beat you. Oh, to be beaten for the sake of Jesus Christ. Whoa. You better shut up, man. I told you, we already beat you. And if that's not enough, we're going to stone you and kill you. Huh. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. If I'm here, I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to serve the Lord with gladness. I'm going to be happy that I serve the Lord. And if I'm persecuted, that's the way it goes. But if I'm dead and gone, I'm going to be with the Lord. It says here at the very end of it that his departure is, his time is at hand. He can see from the little window that he has that God has gotten out of every situation. He's been in prison breaks where the, the Lord came down and the Spirit of God shook the very foundation and allowed him to tell the Philippian jailer, what must you do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't walk out of there. He continued to preach. We need to take that stand. And here he's saying to his student, Timothy, my time for departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. I want you to think about that. Can we say that? Do we know that we are in the midst of a fight? I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but all those who love his appearing. Do you want that crown? Do you want to run that race? Do you want to fight that good fight? You make a decision. I always love the little thing from the first Rocky movie. He was getting clobbered. He was getting beat so badly. And he kept getting knocked down and got up. Knocked down and got up. He finally said to this, the guy in the, in the corner, I'm not going down again. I don't care what he throws at me. I'm not going down again. I'm going to fight the good fight. I'm going to finish this round. I'm going to get to the end. And whatever it is, win, lose, or draw, I'm going to get through it. We need to, as believers, finish the race. We need to fight the good fight. Fight of faith. Keep the faith. And God will give us the reward. Are you ready to fight the fight? Or are you just ready to kind of sit back and ignore all that's going on? Because you see, all the first five verses, those people who are going to be like that, poor people will. They're going to be like that. They are away. They're falling away from God. And they will not be saved. We need to continue to teach them. 
We need to show them, just as uh, Paul was saying, follow my teachings. You know, there are people who are looking at you. You have children and grandchildren and friends and neighbors who are looking at you and how you are teaching them just by your conduct, by your purpose, by your faith, by your patience, by your love. You know, it's not always easy to love those who persecute you. Do you pray for those who persecute you? Do you give to those who are your enemies? It used to be said that you loved your neighbor and hated your enemy. But Jesus says, I tell you that you're to love your enemy. Woo! Do you love your enemies? Are you ready to be a teacher by just showing the things that you do? Are you ready to stay away from bad company? Because bad company, it says, corrupts good morals. Are you ready to think on those things which are good and perfect and holy? Are you ready to keep your, your mind stayed on Jesus Christ and Him alone? Are you? My call to you today is just that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, through the foolishness of preaching, Lord God, I pray that you would direct our course, that we would know that we are in a battle. We know that as we follow you, we will be persecuted. We will have people telling us that what we believe is a lie, that we need to be more of this or that, but let us study the, your word. All scripture is there for us, for us to receive teaching and give teaching. For us to receive rebuke and to give a rebuke. For us to be corrected and help others to be corrected. For training in righteousness. For us to be trained in righteousness and to help others be trained in righteousness. Let us be prepared. Let us be willing. Let us be able to finish the course of our life in giving honor and glory to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's open up our hymn books. Oh,
Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and we ask you, Lord, to help us fight the fight that we are in and to continue on to fight the good fight of faith. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.